In this episode, David talks to Kate about the making of the original The Legend of Zelda. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Zelda podcast. I am David Geisler here with my co host, Kate Fisher. Kate, how are you? Good. How are you? I am well. I'm doing quite well. I'm very, very excited about what we're going to be talking about tonight. Yes. But it might kind of be me reporting to you. It I, will. So I was thinking about this particular episode and that like you would basically be explaining to, I was going to say, act like you're explaining this to like a newbie who doesn't know anything about this. And then I'm like, oh, you don't have to act like it because you will just be explaining this to someone who doesn't not know anything about this particular topic. Well, we were coming up with some ideas. We've all it's always fun to come up with what kinds of kinds of episodes we want to do. Yes. Cuz we're kind of exploring what this podcast is. We had a pretty good idea when we came up with the concept, but it's been it has been fun that our concept has allowed us to have so many different ways to express The Legend of Zelda mm-hmm. and ways to talk about it. There's plenty to talk about. Indeed. And I've been really kind of jonesing to do a deep dive even just personally wanting to learn more about like the development of some of these games, Legend of Zelda games. It's like the most fun research project ever. Oh my gosh, it's, <laughs> it's the best homework in the world. Yay! And um, I kind of, you know, recently I was a little inspired by, by the original The Legend of Zelda. I was kind of dipping back into mm-hmm. it in virtual console and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we went and did some photo shoots on, uh, you know, to, we were taking photographs, Leona and I were taking photographs of literally the Legend of Zelda cartridges. I happen to have the gold one and the gray one. And I was just feeling reminiscent about the Legend of Zelda, the original. And so I kind of, when we were tossing around episode ideas, I said I'd kind of like to do like a, I don't know, like a behind the scenes episode or something of the original The Legend of Zelda. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you very much for it, because I know that you have not played that game thoroughly yet. Correct. Yeah, you've played it just a bit. And I seriously thought maybe I should wait till season two for us to like review the game first Mm -hmm. but then I realized well maybe some of the things that I've learned and some of the things that I kind of already knew but many of the things that I learned over the past couple weeks of doing research for this episode might even inform you as you do when we when we do inevitably play that game yeah for review might be better to have a little more background info before Uh, I I get into it yeah I was starting to think that I'm sorry I just kind of interrupted you but yeah yeah I was thinking that that would be actually maybe kind of cool yeah so I'm very excited to tell you all about so this is what I've done I I did not necessarily go down a rabbit hole, but I, over the past couple of weeks, have it has been a joy. I have found transcripts of interviews done in the 2000s with Miyamoto and Koji Kondo, mm-hmm. and you know, interviews that they did back in the 80s or in the 90s, or even interviews a little bit more recent that were about the development of some of those games, uh, specifically The Legend of Zelda, and um, I have found. Just articles written on uh, the, the, this development. And so as our listeners, some of the information that I'll be talking about today is probably common knowledge to really deep Zelda fans. And some of it hopefully is also new information. And hopefully I can just kind of contextualize and bring and aggregate aggregate a lot of this information together I mean, and provide it as a story. A lot of it will be new to me, that's for sure. So tell us a story, David. I love it. I love it. Well, before <laughs> we get into that too much... Um, I, I, yeah, I'll ask you a few things about The Legend of Zelda. And so from here on out in this episode, when I say The Legend of Zelda, I'll be referring to that original game. Gotcha. The one that came out in 1986. Um, not necessarily the franchise. If, if mm-hmm. I mean the franchise, then I'll speak to the franchise. But anyway, real quick, we got a wonderful tweet from Shane Kelly at still Shane at still sane Shane uh, the other day, and he w- very kindly said, if anyone wants to listen to a great podcast about one of the best topics in video games, check out another Zelda podcast. The two awesome individuals discussing various topics in the realm of Zelda. Um, oh, two awesome individuals. I said the for some reason. Two awesome individuals discussing various topics in the realm of Zelda. Episodes every other Sunday, which maybe that's, that's when he discovers them, but we do actually release them on Friday. Um uh, game dev and he puts a bunch of hashtags in there and he linked to our uh, two our, our favorite boss battles episode. awesome so Shane that's really really great thank you so thank much you. Um, uh, it's just nice to hear it's always it is it's uh, really cool just to a read. real joy I love getting those notifications they make they brighten my day it's very very cool we have a, a slack app that when people tweet us it pops it up in our slack mm-hmm. chat 
And it's just, it's a treasure and a treat every single time that little notification goes off. And Mm -hmm. thank you again, Shane. We'd love to hear more. If anybody's inclined to uh, tweet to us or message us about maybe anything, the things that I'll be talking about in today's episode, or if you've listened to a past episode about a character or something, you can tweet us at Another Zelda Pod. And you can find us on Instagram at Another Zelda Podcast. (laughs) And Facebook is the same. And if you um, are listening to this episode on YouTube, feel free to throw a comment down in there. We see all of it and we love. We, we, we reply to every single thing. At least it feels like we do, yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, and we even more enjoy reading the many of these comments out on the show. Heart emoji, heart emoji. All the heart emojis. Oh, we had one. Yeah, maybe I'll save it for another episode. We had a, a guy from the UK just saying, like, love from the UK, love the episode. And it was very That blew sweet. my mind. I was like, people, I didn't think about how people from anywhere can listen to this, but obviously they can. And that's pretty cool. I tell you what, maybe when we take our break, I'll try to dig that um, tweet out. That'd be fun to read as well. Cool. Okay. Okay. Uh, so anyway. Let's get into it. Kate Fisher. Dave Geisler. The Legend of Zelda. Tell us about it. When was the first time that you played The Legend of Zelda? That was... Probably like in your adult life, I would guess, actually. Mm, no, that As was, a kid? That was Ocarina of Time when I was in... Pardon me. How about the, uh, oh, the, the 1986, original. That's right. The That's Legend right. of Zelda? No, it's um, fine. It's fine. I already forgot your rule. Oh, gosh. <laughs> that was, yes, in my adult life because I had a Wii, so I had to get it... Virtual console Virtual console. So, gosh, not that long ago. Yeah, <laughs> just, that's fine. Just maybe, a few... Maybe five, six years ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, what was your experience with that game? I'm, I'm guessing you had already had Ocarina like in your system. You had Twilight Princess in your uh-huh. your metaphorical system, or your symbolic system, your, yes. your person. Yes. Um. And so, what what made what inclined you to download it and try The Legend of Zelda? I was instructed to by a fellow <laughs> Zelda fan. He's wow. like, "You have to play this. You have to play, you wow. know, all the." old school ones and I was like fair enough yeah. I should do that to be a true fan mm-hmm. so I started to and I was like oh this is weird to go oh, back. maybe I'm almost a true fan I no, forgot how hard games for those systems yes. were mm-hmm. um, which I think we have talked about it I don't know if on the show or off but how or oh no I lied I, li- I have listened to you talk about this before oh. on other shows about how they purposely made them difficult what um, i don't remember didn't it so no, the, let's like go there. what is this what is this i don't know that it well i don't think it was about legend of zelda specifically but like old super nintendo games they would specifically specifically make them difficult so you couldn't just like rent them once and beat oh, them oh i know you what you're like, referring to yeah uh, very quickly well there was a trend in the 90s with super nintendo games mm. and this is when th- video game rental stores were were very, very popular. Right, right. And it was coming off of video rental stores, and then certainly things like Blockbuster became uh, very important. And uh, Disney specifically, but also kind of Nintendo, and I can speak to that in a second, Disney had many of their themed games, Lion King, Aladdin, Pinocchio. Mm -hmm. Um, They Mm kind of had this, it's, it's rumor, but it has also been said to be true that they would make their second level almost impossible to oh, beat. Oh, that's what it was, right, right. So that so you had to... You kind of had to own the game to get good enough. Yep. Oftentimes there would be a puzzle in the second level that required repeat memorization. Mm-hmm. So if you just rented it for an afternoon or an evening as a kid, you know, you'd get that far. It was like a, it was a stop gate. It was a, maybe it was super clever, maybe it was super not cool. Um, but technically the video game systems, you know, it's tricky because I don't want to get off topic here, but um, as a business... The rental structure would lo- you would lose money on your games in a rental you know the the right. the property mm. let's say it's a mom and pop shop video rental store they buy the real game hypothetically and then rent it out well that game only gets purchased once you know so like exactly. um, Nintendo or Disney they're not seeing <clears throat> stuff from that rental maybe Blockbuster cracked that code and offered offered certain rights but I think for the most part you could say that that's not the case. So that's where I, I spoke about that. Yeah, a, yeah, yeah. I so, talked about that on a video series on a different show called Technophiles Podcast that I do. And I was speaking with TC DeWitt from yes. um, the Disney Top Shelf, Disney t- Top Shelf, Top Shelf Disney Animation Studios Library <laughs> Podcast. So, oy, oy, oy. so when I was playing these games, I, you know, and I'm sure it also came with the just the limitations that they had. Like it just had to be more difficult because mm-hmm. it was an earlier game. Um, but I found them Hard to play yeah. sometimes. I the, found myself yeah. dying a lot, which is frustrating. Yeah, we haven't to had me. that since Breath of the Wild or I, until Breath of the Wild. Right. I don't need like a stupid easy video game to play. Um, but 
uh, it was sometimes just harder to enjoy just because of how I, it's hard to go back for me sometimes. Well, I don't know. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And the big thing that sticks out about The Legend of Zelda that is the hardest for me to get used to is the four directional yes, controls. Yes. You do not have what's often referred to as eight directions. You can only go up, down, left, or right mm-hmm. in The Legend of Zelda. And at the time, that there's a lot of things that I'm going to speak to that were completely groundbreaking about the original The Legend of Zelda. And I think at the time, the language of video games just hadn't evolved to eight direction controls yet. Mm-hmm. It was probably theoretically possible. Um, I think by the time like Star Tropics came out in Star Tropics, no, Star Tropics is, is four direction controls as well. But anyway, um, um, so it's stuff like that that makes it very difficult. Uh, the Legend of Zelda to play even today. Sure. I've played it twice. I've played, I've beaten it twice now. And it is, you have to be very careful. You have to, pl- that's what it is. You have to play the game by the game's rules. Mm. You know, it's like, oh, that's that skeleton's not going to bounce back when I hit it with a sword. It will just keep coming at me because they back then they didn't have they didn't write the code that would make the skeleton stumble and fall back and give you a second to reset. Gotcha. They just hadn't written that code yet. They being all of video games, or whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, there's a lot of that. It's a hard one to go back to for those reasons. I should give it another shot. There have been other times when I try to play something where I'm just like, okay, this is impossible, and then I play other video games or I don't know, just get better mm-hmm. at it or something. I go back again. I'm like, oh no, this is doable. I can do this. So if, I should, I should give you, it another try. If you go into many of the old Nintendo games, specifically Nintendo Entertainment System games, if you go into it with the mindset of like, here we go, this is going to be unfairly difficult. Yeah. And you do it for the fun of it. You almost celebrate what games were in the 80s and the mm-hmm. mid, mid and early 80s and, and how much they actually were doing that was amazing. It's just obviously this medium has evolved. Right. I'm like jaded basically now. <laughs> well, you came into the medium around the 64 days, perhaps the Super Nintendo days. Yeah. Yeah. And that's perfectly fine. So anyway, I want to keep moving here. Um, um, so yeah. So the reason like a Nintendo game, maybe it's not designed like Disney's stuff that happened in the 90s, but they are difficult because the restrict there aren't restrictions, just that the code was only that mature. Sure. Sure. Or the language of video games was only that mature. The idea that the original Super Mario Brothers scrolled was like this big, revolutionary. Big deal. Yeah, there were technically games that scrolled before that, but they, the way they loaded their memory in was a little different than how Mario Brothers did it. So anyway, so actually that could lead off on that. So just just some quick facts about um, the Legend of Zelda. The it had a couple directors. It had two directors: Shigeru Miyamoto. That's a name that we hear all the time these mm-hmm. days, and a name that we hear a little less: Takashi Tezuka. Now I've heard his name a little bit here and there, certainly in my research. And uh, Takashi and Shigeru, or Miyamoto and Tezuka, which I might refer to them as, um, Miyamoto was kind of back in the mid '80s, we'll say. So the game came out in 1986, but let's imagine that production started in you know '84 or something like that, mm-hmm. preceding. Um, the Famicom, which was the the Nintendo in Japan, it had come out, and before that though, Shigeru Miyamoto had designed Excite Bike and Donkey Kong, among oh. a few other games. I didn't even know that. for the arcades. <laughs> okay, and they were arcade games. Oh, okay, yeah. And this yeah. is when it, when Nintendo first started making video games, they were making them not as a home console; they were making them as games that would go out in the arcade. Mm-hmm. In fact, Shigeru Miyamoto also famously um, was involved with Baseball, one of the original Nintendo games. And get this, the arcade version, you'd have to put in another quarter, so to speak, for every inning. Oh my <laughs> How clever. It wasn't exactly a quarterback clever girl. then. Yeah, it wasn't a quarterback then, but you can imagine, you sure. know? And so this is a time when video games were all about quick, fast action. Mm-hmm. In fact, something like Donkey Kong was revolutionary because it wasn't there was a whole level that sat right there that you had to to explore through and climb this one screen of uh-huh. a level and there were four different levels that would load up and Mario moved slow he wasn't even called Mario yet he was actually a carpenter not a plumber yet in that mm-hmm. game and uh um, then something like uh, Excite Bite was more action packed. So when Mario Brothers came out again for the arcades, not not to be confused with Super Mario Brothers, mm-hmm. but Mario Brothers, many people are familiar with Mario Brothers because of the mini game that's in Super Mario Brothers Three, which is essentially a, rep- a re representation of Mario Brothers. Um, that was already kind of a, ch- a shift in t- Nintendo's strategy in in making games that are. Uh, Miyamoto was clearly excited about making games that were a little longer or that you could be a little more emotionally invested in sure. things that that he was getting excited about i deduce <clears throat> so anyway 
Um, while while this, it, this technology was advancing, this kind of gameplay was advancing in the arcades, Nintendo of Japan was creating the Famicom, which, which you know, in English, that's obviously a play on family computer. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Famicom was coming out, and The Legend of Zelda was not originally made for the Famicom. Um, Mario Brothers, a Donkey Kong port came out on Famicom, and very, very quickly, the Famicom, Nintendo Japan, uh, decided to create an add-on to the Famicom, and it was the Famicom Disk System. Now, the Disk System used magnetic disks, like floppy disks, like we know in the 90s and stuff, we, you know, when we'd had our homework or whatever in grade school or high school or whatever oh, yes. age we were, it was a magnetic disk drive. And what happened was um, Nintendo was developing this because it gives you read-write capabilities. So up to this point, all the chips, the chips that are in Super Mario Brothers 1, those are ROMs. We kind of know about ROMs these days because of people downloading ROMs on the internet, questionably legally or illegally. Um, but a ROM, it stands for read-only memory, which means that memory is set and you can't write to it. Fair enough? Yes. If you play Mario Brothers, you're just playing the track. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? You're not changing the music or changing the game or anything. You That data stream comes in and it does not change. The hard data. There might be some computation in some of the RAM that's provided that allows you to that allows the game to remember if Mario has the fire flower or something like that, you know, stuff sure. like that. But basically it's just streaming. So Miyamoto was really fascinated with kind of he wanted to create he saw this trend going away from paying a quarter in inning for baseball. This kind of really fast, quick hit in out. Maybe you play for 30 seconds, maybe you play for two minutes and you're out. You're on to the next thing. He was really excited about trying to create something that you could have an emotional investment right. in. Meaningful experience. Meaningful experience. Yes, indeed. And so he specifically, and I'm, I have called this out of many different interviews, so I'm kind of just aggregating this right now, as I said in the beginning of the episode, and I'm also kind of paraphrasing, but Miyamoto said that he specifically remembered um oh so yeah so he specifically remembered like literally sneaking out of the house and exploring the countryside in kyoto japan when he was a kid sometimes he'd find caves and specifically one time remember he remembered finding a i guess you could say lake or a pond he was going through the forest he didn't have a map or anything you know he's just a kid he kind of knew It was the anxiety of getting lost, he has said, and I'm kind of quoting that, Mm -hmm. this adventure element of going out and just exploring and having no, not knowing where you're going, but wondering what you'll find. That was an emotion that stuck with him. Mm -hmm. And it was an emotion that he was trying to recreate in video games. Now, um, Super Mario Brothers and The Legend of Zelda were kind of famously developed at the same time. Um, In fact, technically... What came to be The Legend of Zelda, that concept was actually started development before Super Mario Brothers. And that concept was fed from this idea from Miyamoto and um, later, you know, Takashi Tezuka, this idea of creating something that was Mm open-ended. In fact, while they were developing, now Miyamoto was incredibly involved in Super Mario Brothers as well, as we all know. Um, But The Legend of Zelda and Super Mario Brothers, they were being developed in parallel for the Famicom and there it was it was not an accident that they were going to be two opposite experiences mario brothers was designed to be a little more of that quick fast action mm-hmm. uh, more on execution and action and they were creating another game which its original name was mario adventure and it was going to be a mario trap or a character but they were calling it mario adventure a character where it was supposed to be about not having an endpoint or just exploring and and just going and not you know having again maybe feeding off this energy that Miyamoto was remembering as a kid sure he recalls a specific memory of finding the lake in other interviews he recalls a specific memory of finding a cave and literally going into the cave and being terrified and going back later and when you're in these caves being scared of getting lost and stuff like that did he ever find a treasure chest with a map inside (laughs) of it and it went yeah I don't think so no I don't think so just checking Mm mm-hmm um, so, um, so anyway, Mario Adventure, its initial inspiration, not only was it off of Miyamoto's memories as a kid, but he has said this in, in, in more than one interview, he actually said that he was inspired by the Indiana Jones series, which yeah. had come out just a few years before. Raiders of Lost Ark came out in 81. Mm-hmm. I think Temple of Doom was somewhere in the mid 80s. And I think uh, 
the final one was maybe 89, but I can't quite recall. Oh, the final one. I'm ignoring <laughs> Crystal Skull by accident. <laughs> Just pretend it didn't happen. Just pretend it didn't happen. I think I did read that somewhere about oh, Indiana yeah? Jones. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds familiar. So Indiana Jones is kind of action and adventure and finding items and having items and having literally being equipped with a tool set, like a whip and perhaps a gun and mm-hmm. other things, uh, fed this idea a little bit. Certainly that's different than Mario. So um, they... They, being just, I guess I'll say Nintendo, started playing around with building like a cave or something like that. And they said, what if we can create a tool set that's a cave? Another thing that was very different in the teams, they would literally discuss um, if a game idea came up for a mechanic, they, the designers would decide, oh, that's a Mario idea. Put that in a Mario game. Or, oh, that's a Zelda idea. Well, they weren't calling it Zelda yet. That's a Mario. That's an adventure idea. Put mm-hmm. it in an adventure. And um, so while they were still trying to figure out what Mario Adventure would be, the name kind of eventually became just Adventure when they realized that maybe the storyline and the theming wouldn't be in the Mushroom Kingdom. Mm -hmm. They ended up just calling it Adventure. And um, it started as a level editor because they didn't really build a game. They were just trying to build, what is it? How, what does this even work? How does this even work? What is the language of this game? Sure. They did they decide that it'd be top it down so that it would be, it would, you get your multiple directions and they created almost a level editor. And in-house at Nintendo, while Super Mario was being made, Super Mario Brothers came out before The Legend of Zelda because it was probably a little easier to make that. Well, it was less of a daunting task, right? Right, right. Um, the designers at Nintendo would create these temples and they started creating temples for each other, or dungeons more specifically. And then all of a sudden the dungeons were getting traded around the office and people were playing each other's dungeons. That sounds like a terrible place to work. A terrible place? I'm being sarcastic. Yeah, it sounds like the <laughs> yeah. best place in the yeah, world. No. And I can't help but recall, I, mean, I can't help but think about things like Super Mario Maker now and how, you know, Nintendo has this thing where sometimes we think they're doing something new. And if you really look at their history, there's a, like a repeating con, a repeating concept. Mm-hmm. Um, this disc system for the Famicom, that was repeated as there was literally a disc drive for the Nintendo 64 in Japan and read-write data. And the Famicom had a controller the second controller had a microphone built into it, which I will speak about in a minute here. Hmm. Um, and then, of course, the DSs had microphones years mm-hmm. later. Mm-hmm. It's it's very, very interesting how Nintendo repeats concepts. But in a different and interesting way, I think. Yeah, I feel like sometimes Miyamoto and some of the other designers, they get an idea in their head and they try it out a few times, you know? It takes a couple times to get it quite right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, imagine a scenario where these dungeons are being made and ma- there's a tool set, a toolkit, blocks of data and things like that. And um, uh, specifically Miyamoto and T- T- Tezuka realized that maybe they wanted it to be more than just dungeons. And they got this idea of maybe creating what we would call an overworld. And apparently this started because like one of the dungeons had like a court. They experimented with, oh, maybe there's a courtyard in this dungeon. Oh, that's a new tile set that we have to design and load up a different tile set because it's in the memory and stuff like that. Well, if it's a courtyard, why does it have to be closed off? You know, because the original psychology was four doors up, down, left and right. And either there's a door there or there isn't, Mm -hmm. you know, and then every single room in the original Legend of Zelda in a dungeon is that rectangle that we know. And it's nothing's bigger or smaller. Uh, later on, like in Link's Awakening, we'd see still that screen by screen movement, but they wouldn't necessarily. If you think about the dungeons in The Legend of Zelda, every single one has wall is completely closed off by a wall. Every single room is a room in a dungeon. Mm-hmm. There are not four screens that represent one room, for example. Sure, gotcha. So this is kind of a new idea now because they had pr- permanently programmed in these walls, and then the doors <laughs> would actually overwrite the data. And they thought, oh wow. If we're going to do something outdoors, we have to kind of rewrite, re- rework how this data works. Right. And so it's actually kind of a famous moment. I might be jumping ahead a little bit, but um, I think it was Tezuka, and I might be mistaken about this. Da, 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 da. Uh, sort of development, adventure. Oh, yeah, no, no, I'll speak about this. I was going down my notes here real quick. So another thing that was interesting is Super Mario Brothers uses... The original Super Mario Brothers, we would call it Super Mario Brothers 1, uses the all of the computer chips that are in the regular Nintendo Entertainment System, or more specifically, the Famicom at the time. And uh, de- Nintendo was developing a new chip called the MMC-1. Now, over the course of the Nintendo Entertainment System, Nintendo ended up developing six versions of these chips. The most famous MMC chip, people may not realize this, but the most famous MMC chip is the MMC-3, which is the chip... That was put into Super Mario Brothers 3, which allowed, which had a little bit more RAM and allowed for diagonal scrolling. 
Okay. Super Mario Brothers 3 is one of the first games that really does that. Mm -hmm. Famously, games like, I've said this before on this show, famously games like The Legend of Zelda and uh, Metroid can only scroll one direction at a time. Yep. So the MMC chip, MMC1 specifically, allowed a little extra memory um, and also allowed a save mechanic. Now, that is different than a save mechanic that we know today in our battery-backed-up chips Mm -hmm. that we use in cartridges. Mm -hmm. The save mechanic was an idea. So basically, as the disk drive was being developed for the Famicom, Miyamoto was very keen to this idea of reading and writing data because he obviously started to connect. He and the team started to connect. Oh, if we... um, you know, you can you can come back into a game and have data maintain. You see, you see what I'm saying? Like, today yeah. we, we we just take this for granted. It's just right. save files, but that was like an awesome new concept. And so now, if you don't, if you acquire an item, a special hat, special boots, a special sword, or you defeat an, an a, a, a temple or a dungeon or something like that, the game can remember that. Mm-hmm. Now, the reason the game could remember remember that is because this magnetic data would be written to a magnetic disk drive just like a floppy disk. Floppy disks don't need power to maintain their memory. You know, a computer chip does need to have power to maintain its memory. So this was brilliant. This is a perfect idea. Oh, we have our normal Nintendo. We have this chip that gives us a little extra memory so we can store more things, which actually made the overworld possible. Okay. And um, um, we have this save mechanic. So this was going to be, The Legend of Zelda was going to, intended to be the big huge the next thing from Miyamoto the next thing from the people who made Super Mario Brothers it's coming to the Famicom disk system and to be honest it wasn't a failure um the the Legend of Zelda was released in 1986 for the Famicom disk drive and um this is something that's actually quite interesting the way it was released was not physical so there is really odd connections to like virtual console and WiiWare stuff mm. where you, you would go to a store. The most common way to purchase The Legend of Zelda in Japan for the Famicom disk drive was you would, the Famicom disk drive came with some disks and sometimes you could buy new disks. But every time, often with the Famicom disk drive, you could take a disk, bring it to a store, buy a game. They would write the game onto the disk and oh then you take the disk home. <laughs> Very wow. common. So now, I mean, just as a side note, Famicom discs that have certain games written on them are highly valuable in the collector sure. community. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you might even buy a Famicom disc and not know what's on it yet. <laughs> you know, it's like all these little mysteries. So anyway. It's like someone burning you a mixed CD. Indeed. Absolutely. <laughs> and I can't help but also remember when um, the DSs had those Wi-Fi hotspots like at Targets and Best Buys where you'd walk into the store and you could download demos oh, onto your DS. Wow. It's like the same thing. Yeah. And you would store that uh, for the DSs, you'd store that in your RAM as long as the DS was on. Once you turned it off because uh, you need power to save or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly the DSs have that battery, but they just didn't want to store it in the RAM, I don't think. But anyway, okay, you close it and okay, you don't have the demo anymore. So people would go to um, a store they would purchase The Legend of Zelda it would get written to one of their discs but Nintendo kind of thought oh you know there isn't anything physical here to be represented there isn't like you can't you're not you just take that disc home and people may want to have a physical representation of the game Mm -hmm. so they thought let's make a booklet let's make an instruction booklet Mm -hmm. that has, and that's why if you look at it, and I actually wanted to bring mine here. I have one. It's a little beat up, but I wanted to bring it for you to look at, and I actually forgot it before I headed out from Chicago this morning. But um, what would happen is they would buy the game, get rid of a disc, and they'd get handed one of these booklets, perhaps in a bag, perhaps not. I understand not necessarily a box or anything, just this book. And you take the book home, and it has an entire storyline in it. It has a map of the overworld in oh, it. Oh, cool. It has tips and tricks helpful. up through the first two dungeons. Okay. And it has breakdowns of all the enemies, or many of the enemies at least. And that was their way of letting someone still have a tangible pride or in you know in this thing that they bought or this game that they have. Otherwise, it's all just it's all just abstract data. Sure. <laughs> These days we'd say it's data in the cloud or something, right? Like it's like it's just kind of this abstract, it's you know, it's on someone's server somewhere, but it, we just we don't really know. Mm-hmm. Okay, fine. So I so that was kind of the birth of the true instruction manual, too. Awesome. So The Legend of Zelda. Uh the first one of the first games to 
have a nonlinear narrative, one of the first games to have a save. I think absolutely the first game to truly have a save feature. I was going to ask you that, yeah, yeah if it that, was. That was console-based, pardon me. There might have been computer games, obviously, that could save data and write sure. disk drives. Uh, gotcha. Mm-hmm. But the first, maybe we could say like arcade game, because at this time, they didn't. what is a console? We know what consoles are now, but that was like a home system. Mm-hmm. It was literally called the family computer. They didn't really have a name for these kind of things yet. Um, and so anyway, I did a little bit of math here. The disk drive came out shortly after the Famicom, as I mentioned. The, fam- the disk drive was fairly popular in Japan, but it, w- it did not translate to an American market. So the Nintendo Entertainment System, which is the American equivalent of the Famicom, I think many people know that. The Nintendo Entertainment System came out, and it did have an expansion pack on the bottom, or expansion port on the bottom. Mm-hmm. And also, that's a repeat of things like expansion ports on the bottom of the GameCube, which I know you are using because there's a Game Boy player that mm-hmm. I lent you to play Minish Cap right now. Which I had no idea existed. Yep, yep. The Nintendo 64 had an expansion port on the bottom for its disk drive that it only came out in Japan. So, um, r- real quick, just to jump forward a little bit, when the game came out in 1987, a year later... For America, mm-hmm. there was a real problem. How do they do this save system? Well, what happened was um, it was decided. So games like Metroid, which came out for the disk system in Japan, you could save your game for the original Metroid. Well, in America, they didn't have the save system. They didn't have this non-powered magnetic way to save information. Mm-hmm. So Metroid solved it by having incredibly complicated passwords. You know, they would literally oh, save yeah. the data in the passwords. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those passwords are dynamic. Those aren't. Those passwords are. Those, those passwords do hold data. That's why you can make up bogus passwords in Metroid and actually get some version of a game. Hmm. So anyway, um, in America, as we all know, what happened was they said, no, we're going to bring it out as a cartridge. The American cartridges were a different shape than the Famicom cartridges. The American cartridges were physically a little bigger on the outside. The inside wasn't necessarily bigger. The, the chips that were used wasn't necessarily bigger. But for some reason, the American market, I think they were trying to make them feel a little bit more like video cassettes, personally. Gotcha. In America, oh, sure. yeah. Because the whole thing with it was this is also around the time where the Atari crash is happening, and like like video games are actually actually entering their first true crash around this time, maybe a year or so after. So Nintendo, or maybe a year or so before, Nintendo's positioning the Nintendo Entertainment System as a well entertainment system. <laughs> They specifically, How appropriate. Yeah, they specifically wanted it to feel like a VCR or a video player. That's why you put the cartridges in sideways. None of this clicking in from the top, which the Famicom did click in from the top. Hmm. Um, anyway, uh, so the way that Nintendo of America solved it, as everyone probably already knows, is they put a little watch battery inside the cartridge that powered a RAM chip that then did the save data. So instead of writing that save data to a magnetic strip or disk, um, it was saved as a as static data it's you know it's a little bit like how we have um flash drives now you know static these things that aren't spinning hard drives we can save data to a chip yeah so that's how it was saved in the uh legend of zelda cartridge so i think i'm coming up on needing to take a break here but i think i want to say one thing before we go to break i did a little bit of math on the size of the original the legend of zelda it it famously all the data that i found says that the entire game was 112 kilobytes <laughs> of information. The entire game. And that was the big one. Yeah. Because they had the Isn't MMC1 chip. It was, there still, were, there still were restrictions. They had to really be very careful with how they would reuse their sprite assets and stuff like that. And many of the sprites were created through data, not through saved files, whereas today it would be like a PNG or a JPEG or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Back then, a lot of times it was code that was writing these sprites on a sprite sheet, and then that sprite sheet was getting loaded. So anyway, um, two quick things about the size of The Legend of Zelda, and then we'll go to break and I'll come back and talk about really more like the effects of the game and, and when they were actually truly building it then. So um, the size of the game, uh, I believe that it was Tezuka, um, though it might have been Toshiko Nakago, Nakago. I think it might have been Nakago in my research. One of the programmers, they were trying to figure out a way to how are they going to fit these dungeons, these big, big, huge dungeons and all this overworld into this small. I think it was their RAM was small. They didn't have a lot of RAM to work with. Mm -hmm. So they could save a big, big world, but they couldn't load much at a single time. You see where I'm going with this? Yep. 
So one of the programmers was running the math and he said, well, if we get really clever and if we save templates and we save um, if something like the walls around the edges of the dungeon always load no matter what, that kind of stuff. If we do some clever, clever tricks here, we can load a tile set of rooms and then load those rooms up and then we can build larger dungeons. So in other words, imagine instead of if a dungeon is 20 rooms, instead of uh, saving 20 versions of rooms, maybe they save five templates and if you order these templates, if you apply one to two to three to four or five of them on a single room, it creates its own room. Oh, okay. See where I'm going with this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe there's a template with a door on the top and the left, and there's another template with stuff just in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, and you mix and match these templates, you're only saving five things, but you can create 20 rooms. Theoretically, those are not the true numbers. I'm just trying to make my sure. point. So anyway, he goes off and he figures this math out and he's very proud of himself. He says, hey, we can fit it. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> hey, guys, look at what I figured out on this graph paper here. And we have I have images of some of the first um, drawings ever made for these dungeons. And I think maybe we'll share that out on our Twitter or yeah, something like that. Yeah, we should. Um, and he was so excited. He said, I got it. I've got it to fit. And he shows them the math and he was so, so proud of himself and it was brilliant. And Shigeru Miyamoto... Um, noticed, if I have my information correctly, he noticed that there was a minor error. And he said, well, and, and uh, it was realized that the compression was so good that this person actually compressed double. In other words, it was only using half the memory. And they said, oh my gosh, that's only half the memory. And the programmer said, oh yeah, I think I kind of messed up. And Miyamoto said, wait, 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 wait. That's perfect. Let's make a second quest. Uh -huh. And that is how the master quest was born. Uh -huh. Truly. Super, super cool. So finally, this is a pretty, this is pretty exciting. And then we're going to go to break. I did this math on my own by all sources. So it's probably wrong. So it's probably wrong. <laughs> all, all the sources I can find say that that um, the Legend of Zelda is 112 kilobytes, right? Mm -hmm. By contrast, a phone we take a photo we take on our phone is easily five megabytes. Um, um. I did some personal research. I downloaded, I do not condone stealing games through ROMs or anything like that. I've personally purchased The Legend of Zelda multiple times <laughs> through different co virtual, co every virtual console, mm -hmm. and I have it on the NES, NES Mini Classic, and I have purchased it through, um, you know, used game stores as well as the real thing. So I have no guilt here. But just, just as an experiment, I went online and tried to find some ROMs of The Legend of Zelda. Um, and I found the closest that I could find was a ROM, and it was compressed down to 64 kilobytes, and when I unzipped it, it came out at 131. So that's a little bigger than 112, mm -hmm. but it um, seems pretty close. Maybe the ROM has a little extra junk in it that ROM hackers threw in there. Who knows? You never know, right? So if we go with 112 kilobytes, I wanted to do a little experiment. Um, the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is 13.4 gigabytes. Oh, my God. <laughs> And actually, the Switch version, I think, is only 13 gigabytes. Maybe maybe there's some compression that the Switch can do that the Wii U can't do. Mm -hmm. But the Wii U file size is 3.4 gigabytes. So I just wanted to do some math. And I thought, hmm, <laughs> I wonder how many copies how many of The Legend, Legend of Zelda Zeldas? would fit in the Breath of the Wild. In Breath of the Wild. And so that, I did the math. I broke up. I broke it down. And it turns out that one hundred and nineteen thousand six hundred and forty three <laughs> the legend of zeldas could fit in 13.4 gigabytes of space oh my goodness one hundred nineteen thousand six hundred forty three times bigger the breath of the wild is and i mean it makes sense ridiculous <laughs> the next one's gonna be double that size <laughs> right right <laughs> the next the next legend of zelda game will be literally impossible to complete <laughs> just <laughs> Don't even try. It's just like a streaming thing. Um, and then, uh, you know, I know I said I was going to go to break, but one more little thing about the translation from um, 1986 to 1987 and the Japanese version to the Nintendo version is um, something that was in the booklet. There's there's little hints that when the booklet came to America and just got put in the box. No, I'm going to save this. I'm going to save this for ooh, after the ooh. break. Yeah. Little 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 things in the translation. Cliffhanger. Yeah, right. A real, real cliffhanger. Now here. you guys have to listen to the rest of the episode. They're losing <laughs> their minds. <laughs> They're waiting for over the next minute while they listen to some promo for some other show. Their nose is just going to start bleeding because they're going to be so stressed about what we're talking about right now. What was he going to say? What was he going to say? I can't wait. Oh, my goodness. Oh my 50 more seconds. 40 more seconds. <laughs> All right, Kate, I'll see you in a minute. Okay. Hey everyone, David Geisler here, and I am very excited to share that we have just launched our Patreon page for another Zelda podcast. 
Patreon is a great way for creators to grow their content, and we're really looking forward to using this space as a way to say thank you to our listeners. We'd love to have your support, and we've put together some rewards that we're pretty excited about. Things like additional uncut bonus content, custom wallpapers, and of course, early access to all of our episodes. So if you'd like, after the show, head on over to our page at patreon.com slash anotherzeldapodcast. You can also find a link to the page in our show notes. Thank you very much. Okay, Kate, so before the break, I was very excited to talk about one other kind of, I guess, difference between the Japanese version and the American version of yes. The Legend of Zelda. You left us all hanging. Oh boy, was it a cliffhanger. <laughs> well, I hope it delivers. Um, I, I don't know if it will. <laughs> but just There's another... nothing interesting to this fact <laughs> at all. No, because Well, in the second half here, we're going to get into things. I have some information about like when they were playtesting the game. I have information about more like design when they were designing the game. Mm-hmm. Once they got, once, once the team learned and learned what kind of tech they were working with. Because originally, you know, there was a lot of tech that was informing this game. This disk drive thing, the, the new memory chip. That must have been an exciting time back in like 1984, 1985. I can't even imagine all oh, what I'd give to be on that team. Oh, I know. So cool. So anyway, um, you know, it makes you wonder what people are doing. Like, is it is it VR right now that people are working on stuff that's blowing their mind? They're getting excited in, in laboratories across the world. Anyway, um... Uh, oh yeah, so so the one thing is I mentioned that microphone that was on the second controller for the Famicom, mm-hmm. you know, and of course there's microphones on the Wii U and 3DSs and all that stuff and DSs. Um, the Poles voice, P O L S V O I C E, or maybe it's Poles Vak. Um, they're the little bunny rabbits that jump around. In there were a few in Link's Awakening, you might recall. They kind of just look like bunny rabbit faces, and they hop around in some of the uh, oh yeah 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 dungeons. Yes, yes, I know what mm-hmm. you're talking about. We'll just call them a pole. I think they're poles voice, but boy, my dyslexia might be getting the best of me. Maybe it's just like a pole vok or something like that. But anyway, the, there's a there's a moment in the instruction manual when you're going through this really cool instruction manual, and I'm heartbroken I didn't bring it with me today because I just want to show it to you. Um, um, where it says it's giving you tips and hints about how to defeat common enemies, and the poles voice one says. Poles don't like loud noises. And a lot of Ameri- North American people think like, oh, am I supposed to play the flute? Or am I supposed to like, what, am I, what creates a noise? Mm-hmm. And what it was, was in the Japanese version, you had to literally yell into the second controller. Oh my God. <laughs> and that would, you know, defeat it. There's other ways to defeat these little rabbit heads. Um, some people, you know, you can kind of hack it by just blowing into the mic and still peeking it. And certainly the DS does stuff like that. Phantom Hourglass absolutely has a few mechanics where you have to blow out candles and oh, yeah. you know, shout. I remember you talking about those. I was replaying uh, uh, Phantom Hourglass on the Wii U right now. And yeah, there was a moment where I was talking to a character on the other side of a door and the fairy says like, hey, why don't you yell real loud at her? And I was like, oh boy, do I have to do this? Hey! You know, like <laughs> in the real world. Huh? <laughs> so, but that actually stuck through. That went through the translation and everything into the American instruction booklet. Which is kind of funny, which is kind of cool. Okay, so now that we've kind of gotten past the tech of the game and the, and the team realizing how they could make this game, I'd like to talk a little bit about the design of the game in the early days. So again, kind of hearkening back to this adventure element, the, it was very important to Miyamoto, and he speaks to this point in many interviews, it was very important to him to almost have a level of, of anxiety in the game where it's like this balancing act of adventure but anxiety of getting lost and peril. too, a little bit, and not and not. It's, he didn't want the game to be scary because there's knives and spikes everywhere. Mm-hmm. He wanted it to be scary be, uh, in a natural way. He's, I think, this is like a famous quote, but he has said many times, and many people have reported on this, that he wanted to give players a tiny garden that they could walk around with. Was like his goal. Literally, like the overworld is a single garden. You're not loading multiple levels. It is. It exists in a constant state. Sound like Breath of the Wild. Mm. And people can go through it and live in it however they want. Mm-hmm. Is what he was trying to accomplish. And uh, secondly, there are a million, 
I'm, I'm exaggerating, a million like secrets and secret doors in the Legend of Zelda overworld and certainly even in some of the dungeons. But there are, in my opinion, almost completely random as to where they are. I've seen some YouTube videos on this, which is ridiculous. And that's why I needed some help in Link's Awakening because I'm like, I don't know that I'm supposed to put this bomb next to this specific part on this specific wall. Well, in later games, they started informing you with like a special tile on the ground. Right. You'll definitely experience this with Minish Cap. You'll become a, a much more... Um, seasoned 2D Zelda player. And I'm sure that when you play Minish Cap for our review, you're going to be like, weird tile on the ground, I'm bombing the wall. You know what I mean? <laughs> I got this. And there's a little bit of that in Link's Awakening, but in, in The Legend of Zelda, there isn't any. Oh my. And um, there are times in The Legend of Zelda where you do need to bomb a wall. I think I even spoke to this in our Link's Awakening episode where it, once you get used to playing The Legend of Zelda, if there's a room and there is not a door on you one of the sides, something. you bomb it because you just got to check. You know, it's a little bit of that Metroid stuff, as I've said in the past. Mm. Anyway, so yeah, um, secrets inside the dungeons is cool, but there's actually a plethora of secrets that are kind of periphery in the overworld. Just about every screen has one tile that can be bombed or burned or hacked or slashed, and a bush will burn and reveal a staircase that goes down into a cave. Mm. I would go so far as to say there might even be a hundred of them. I would, it'd be fun to count one day. You can go online and download maps that show every single little tile and you can cheat when you play it on your Nest Mini Classic or your virtual like console. That <laughs> Well, and that's, I guess that's okay. But I was, I remember looking at one of these maps a few years ago when the Nest Mini Classic came out because I was having some fun finding all the little hidden caves, we'll call them. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking like, this is a lot of secrets. This is like every single screen has something on it. But then I realized as I was researching this, Miyamoto said he wanted to put secrets everywhere because this was, I'm now saying this, not him, this was in an age way before the internet, way before fast hive-based communication where Mm -hmm. everyone can communicate about something. And not even necessarily just messages, literally passive communication, like creating a graphic that shows where all these things are that gets shared to the world, which is what the internet gives us these days, Mm -hmm. certainly. His whole idea was he wanted it to be a game that maybe you only found five of these secrets out of the, the the hundred or 40 or whatever as a normal player one day you just happen to bomb a wall and you're like whoa what and he wanted people to hypothetically speaking go to the water cooler the next monday yeah and tell them oh but did you hear about this did you hear about that you could do this he wanted for there to be a conversation around the game so actually he also famously mentioned that in that instruction booklet he was a little dis he was very proud of the booklet but he was nervous because he didn't want to give away too many secrets he really wanted this game to be a mystery in the beginning now it kind of went both directions um when they were originally play testing this game which at the time as they were getting further in development yeah it was called mario adventure then internally they started calling it adventure the real name for this game as they were developing it and turning it into a real game was the hyrule fantasy because, again, they felt the game was about Hyrule. It was mm-hmm. about this garden, this overworld. <clears throat> Sound like Breath of the Wild. <laughs> where the title was about the space, not a thing. You know, all the other Zelda games are about a thing or a character. Sure. Breath of the Wild is like one of the few that's actually about the environment. So the Hyrule fantasy was going to be the name of the series. They expected to make sequels. If this worked out well, they'd want to. Mm -hmm. They'd continue making Hyrule fantasies. Mm -hmm. And uh, as the game was progressing and the narrative was starting to get built and this princess needed to get saved, um, they ended up naming the princess Zelda. Everybody knows it's named Zelda Fitzgerald. Um, They thought, oh, well, a nice subtitle. How about it's The Legend of Zelda? So this game was going to be the Hyrule fantasy. The Legend of Zelda. Oh. You know, maybe the sequel would be the Hyrule Fantasy Link's Adventures. Sure, sure, the sure. The Adventure of Link. Hardy har har, which it kind of <laughs> was, right? Uh-huh. So anyway, they name it the Hyrule Fantasy, and they start play testing it. And players, um, and, and this, this original famous screen that we know where you can go up, left, or right, and just green surroundings around you, green rock-like structures are around you. The players would start there. They'd have their sword. They'd have their shield. And no one knew what to do. <laughs> the players. Sure. In the play testing. This is like an infamous story. Like, and this happened what? more than once. This, they, they were, you know, uh, the, this, this, the, the, the legend goes that players would play test this and go, wait, I just, I just walk around? Wait, am I sp- well, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to go up? Am I supposed to go left? Am I supposed to- <laughs> what am I supposed to do with this game? You do you. You do you. This was also a, com- this is, if that concept blows people's minds now, it was un thinkable Mm -hmm. back in the mid 80s -hmm. this is coming off of we're playing you know playing games like donkey kong and joust and and asteroids and like 
clear objective, do the thing now. Even Mario was run to the right. Yeah, right. The original Super Mario Brothers yeah. was run to the right. Um, so they were really like scratching their heads, the designers and the programmers. And um, Miyamoto, in a brilliant move, in my opinion, um, decided, whoa, the game is so hard. People aren't, they don't, they don't know where to go. They, 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 how do we teach them what, how to play this game? Without telling them, you know? Right. I love this whole, like, teach, don't tell thing. Mm -hmm. The worst thing in the world, and sometimes Twilight Princess, even though I love that game, falls victim to this. Sure. Is boxes of dialogue telling you how to play a game. Mm -hmm. The best versions of a game are something like um, Mega Man X or other games where the opening levels, uh, Yoshi's Island, Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island, where they just teach you how to play the game. Mm -hmm. When that's done right, it's just brilliant. Um, So what Miyamoto did was... He decided to take the sword away from the player right in the beginning. Uh So he quantifiably made the game harder in the beginning. But what it does is they, 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 right in that first screen, they put a black square, which is representative of going into a cave. So you don't even have to travel to another screen. If you're the player and you load up that first screen, you can go up, down, left, or right. But like, what's this black door? I guess maybe I'll try going in the door right away the old man gives you the sword. Mm-hmm. It's dangerous to go alone. Take this. Right. That wasn't in the original build. Uh-huh. They put that in because what it does is within the first mm-hmm. minute or 30 seconds, it tells the player how to play the game. Oh, whether the player realizes it or not. Oh, this is a game where I'm going to go get stuff. I'm going to mm-hmm. explore and I'm going to get stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's all. There was a pretty lengthy um, narrative written by, I have his name here, written by Keji. Ter, terui, terui, T-E-R-U-I. Okay. Terui. Keji Terui uh, wrote the manual backstory. And the backstory includes Impa. Impa was never seen, but Impa's in the original storyline. Oh, cool. She is up. Zelda's in danger. Impa runs to try to find help. She gets attacked by some, some moblins. Link just happens to save her. She recognizes Link to be the hero. Link doesn't know what he's talking about. So this whole theme of Link not really knowing what he's getting himself into. Sure. It was right there from the beginning. So none of that narrative is necessarily in the game, but it is in the instruction manual. Yeah. So, but from gameplay wise, um, that's what it is. Oh, go get the sword. And I guess I'm going to adventure. And then you start learning that there's dungeons. You may not even know that in the beginning as you play the game. You start, you know, and it's all about just exploring and adventuring. So I thought that was super cool. And it was such a brilliant way of teaching people how to, how to play the game, not telling them how to yeah, play the game. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the overworld was designed after many of the dungeons. Certainly they went back in and refined some of the dungeons. Um, the overworld was kind of a new concept, this, this static world that got saved. Uh, let's see, the Hyrule Fantasy. So when the game was about to be released, Final Fantasy came out by Square. Ooh. Or Square Soft. Name back conflict. Then. So yes, absolutely. And so technically, technically... The original Famicom release for The Legend of Zelda still has the Hyrule Fantasy in it, um, but it's as a subtitle, I understand. That might be up for interpretation just based on the size of the text. There is not a colon like we would see in English, you know, for a subtitle. Yeah. But it's The Legend of Zelda, the Hyrule Fantasy is kind of implied to be the subtitle. And so they downplayed the Hyrule Fantasy Mm -hmm. name. When it came to America a year later, Final Fantasy had become very popular and The Legend of Zelda just started clicking and, and Nintendo and Nintendo of America, Nintendo of Japan decided to just call the American release The Legend of Zelda. Well, therein is the birth of the name. And it all began. Mm-hmm. It's true. It's true. The Legend of Zelda comes from there. I just think it's so wonderful that it was originally the uh, subtitle. Cool. So um, the dungeons were first. Yes. Yeah, so when the game was first being developed before the overworld, I'm backtracking just a little bit. Um, when they were just designing dungeons, Miyamoto and the other designers thought, well, maybe this is a game where you just go dungeon to dungeon to dungeon to dungeon because there were many dungeon, what we would call a dungeon crawler these days. Um, there were some action or adventure style castle games where people would go from a dungeon, you get to the end and then you start up in another dungeon. Um, so this idea of having an overworld was kind of new. Um, but it reminds me of when they were developing, when Nintendo was developing Zelda 64 for the Nintendo 64 before it was titled Ocarina of Time. Because mm-hmm. everything had to be something 64. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, they didn't know if they were going to have enough memory in the Nintendo 64 to build an overworld. 
And for a while, the idea was going to be that the entire, all of Zelda 64 was going to take place inside the, the castle at the, what we would call at the end of the game. Mm-hmm. And Link would travel to lands, a la Mario 64. And that's all they were going to do. Paintings. Because that's all they would have the memory for. Sure. And Miyamoto has also said, he said, I didn't love the idea, but if it meant bringing Link to 3D, I was going to do it. Mm-hmm. And then later they learned how to cash out um, the, uh, uh, the Hyrule Field in Ocarina of Time. The down the the trade off was Ocarina of Time, Hyrule Field. If you really pay attention, it's pretty sparse. Obviously, that's kind of clear. Sure, but its polygons are enormous. <laughs> if you really think about it in your memory, Ocarina of Time right now, a hill might be two or three polygons, and those polygons are enormous. Uh-huh. They stretch for hundreds and hundreds of feet. If you're trying to like do it to scale, uh-huh. okay, fine. So that I couldn't help but think about that. How the original conception of the Legend of Zelda what parallels the some of the conception of Zelda sixty four. And uh, let's see. Oh, I have a quote here from Miyamoto when he was kind of dealing with this whole sword thing, taking the sword away. He said in an interview in 2003 with Superplay magazine, he said, I remember that we were very nervous because The Legend of Zelda was our first game that forced players to think about what they should do next. Mm -hmm. And I loved finding that quote because that is the very facet of the Legend of Zelda is the very thing that I love so much about every Legend of Zelda game and yeah. why I love Legend of Zelda games. It's a game, there's plenty of other games that do that that these days as well, but it's a game that uh, forces the player to think about what they should do next. Just love it. That's, that when I said in our uh, Wind Waker episode, when Zelda is its strongest is when it's refined and logical and 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 um, allows you to explore on your own. Mm-hmm. When it's its weakest is when it's just follow a breadcrumb trail or something like that. Right. Um, uh, figuratively follow a breadcrumb trail. Well, I think this just lines up great. So yeah, it came out in 1986 in Japan, came out in 1987 in America. It sold 6.5 million copies to date. But if you include virtual consoles and, and all the other versions that Nintendo has sold it, it's actually sold a little over 9 million um, copies, which is super cool. Yeah. And I actually just clicked a link here because I have some other data about other systems. This is... Uh, uh, some of the other Zeldas. Just, okay. And then I'm done with the episode. Um, but And we can chat about this a little bit. But yeah. uh, So Total, The Legend of Zelda, came out in 1986. If we include the NES Classic Edition, Legend of Zelda, Virtual Console, all that stuff, it sold 9.3 million copies to date. And there's only a few games that sold more than that. The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, Total, has sold 12.7. But actually only... Actually undersold. Okay, this might get a little complicated, but just bear with me. The original NES release of The Legend of Zelda sold 6.5 million. The original release of A Link to the Past sold 4.6 million. The original release of Ocarina of Time sold 7.6 million. Mm -hmm. Uh, The original Majora's Mask is only three. So um, Twilight Princess is one of the highest initial sellings of 8.8 million for just the, the GameCube and Wii together. Sure. And that was so different. It's true, but if we continue, if we include full sales of every version, Legend of Zelda is nine point three million, and it is surpassed by Links to the Past, which Link to the Past did not beat it for just its original sales. Mm-hmm. Link to the Past is twelve million. Ocarina of Time is thirteen million now, and those are the heavy hitters. Very cool. Twilight Princess is a total of nine million right now skyward sword is a total of only three million (laughs) breath of the wild is plus 10 million right now 10 plus and counting so um this is just one more little fun fact about all of the legend of zelda games more than 98.8 million copies if you include all 20 versions of legend of zelda have been sold that's bonkers crazy right yeah so anyway that was kind of neat so we should obviously have 98 million listeners (laughs) Yeah, it sounds about right. Eventually, right? Sounds about right. So any, I don't know, do you have any questions or anything? This is kind of, this is such a cool adventure to learn about. And there were so many other things that I read, but I was just really, things, things that stuck out for me was, was this, how how exciting it must have been to figure out what this game even could be, mm-hmm. balancing that with the tech and the hardware that was being made at the time, creating a language, a style of game to be copied and repeated forever, creating something out of nothing, this language of this kind of game. Super cool. Oh, there's one quick little story about the music, too, actually. Oh, okay. uh, Koji Kondo wrote all the music, and he, to this day, writes much of the music for many of the games. The actual opening song on the title 
um, gunk, 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 you know, whatever it is, mm-hmm. um, which is actually a little reminiscent of Indiana Jones. Now that I think about it, it has yeah, a little bit of a absolutely. Western feel with that. Yeah. Um, was written in one night. And it was because he actually had like the bolero of fire or something, the bolero, some classical song that he basically transcribed. Um, and that was going to be the Legend of Zelda's big theme song was this piece of classical music. And in Japan, a piece becomes available, its copyright gets released or becomes available to the public after 50 years of being created. And I think, or maybe it's 50 years after the writer dies or something like that. Mm-hmm. It might be the creator of that artwork dies. And so Nintendo knew that this Bolero, Rondo Bolero of something, um, it turns out that it was only... It was like a year away from being available to the public. Mm-hmm. And they thought, you know, common knowledge, uh, the designers thought, oh, it's been enough time. And then they learned legally that, no, it's like just on the edge of not being enough time. And the game needed to be released. It was supposed to come out with the disc system. It was all, all everything was in place. And Koji Kondo, in a single night, wrote what we know as to be the Legend of Zelda theme song, what we would call maybe, maybe, no, I would not call it Hyrule Field theme because that's different in Ocarina. But what we would consider that, kung, 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 kung. yeah, 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 um, was written in a night. So that's kind of cool too. And the world was forever changed. Forever changed. I love that song. <laughs> me too. That song it's makes stuck me in my head. Feel good constantly. Yeah. Cooking. We were cooking dinner the other night, and Leon and I just for the fun of it, I put on the uh, that twenty five fifth anniversary yeah. orchestration version that came out with Skyward Sword. Mm-hmm. And um, I wasn't able to find it on iTunes, but I just ripped the CD onto my library, and then you know whatever it is, iTunes Match like puts it in your cloud or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I queued it up and we were listening and she was like, this is so epic. And yeah. <laughs> she's actually into it quite a bit. Gosh, have you seen it live? Like seen the orchestra? I've never had the opportunity. I, so cool because it is very epic. I'm sure. Um, so, so any thoughts about all this? Well, so I remember before we started recording this show that kind mm. of like maybe was part of the impetus for the show was you and I were talking about Breath of the Wild and how it had the same water cooler thing where that's what you loved about it was that people would talk to each other about like, how did you do this? Where did you go first? What did you do? How did you complete this puzzle? And it goes all the way back to the development of the first game. So like they've just been, and obviously not all the games are as easily discussable, you know, as, right. As, as open world as breath of the wild is that that's definitely a major part of why you liked it so much. I remember I, well, I remember renting The Legend of Zelda back in the late 80s. And as a kid, I was so into the idea, but it was so difficult that I could not get very far. You know, if I was lucky, I would get into like the first dungeon or something. Mm-hmm. If I was lucky. <laughs> That's me now. <laughs> um, but I loved the idea. I loved that I could just be in this world. It, like, it captivated me. Um, when I spoke about Twilight Princess in our Twilight Princess episode, I think being kind of like... I, I said Twilight Princess... Okay, what... When I played Ocarina as a teenager, that world in my imagination, like Twilight Princess was what I imagined Ocarina to be. Whereas if you play Ocarina, your imagination fills in a lot of the gaps and makes the graphics bigger and you Mm -hmm. imagine the world more. And I said that Twilight Princess realized a lot of those things for me, literally. Mm -hmm. The graphics were better and I could just live in that world more. I would say even more impactfully, that's not exactly a sentence, but um, the experience, my experience with Breath of the Wild was what The Legend of Zelda was in my imagination oh, okay. 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I fell in love with Breath of the Wild immediately, even though we have had conversations about more temples would have been fun or this or that would have been cool. Mm-hmm. But for me, that idea of coming out of that cave in Breath of the Wild and not exactly... I mean, if you're smart, you go over to Old Man, you know, but you don't have to. But you don't have to. You certainly don't have to in the original. But that adventure and that anxiety and that uh, having to... Oh, oh, by the way... I play um, Breath of the Wild, and I have done this from the beginning with all the mini maps turned off, all that stuff. I turn it all off because mm-hmm. I just want to kind of like organically remember it. I'm trying to do it as if I was in the woods for real, like I'm just doing you landmarks. Recreate, yeah, his experience. I want that adventure. <laughs> yeah, I really do. And you definitely do that in the Legend of Zelda, the original. And you sure. spoke to that a little bit in Link's Awakening episode, where it was like, oh my gosh, this crazy map. I have to like memorize this two tiles over yeah. and three tiles up. Yeah. It's all part of it. It's remembering your way out of a maze if you have to. There's a cool feeling to that. Yeah, absolutely. 
That's all I have to say. I thought Thank it was kind of a cool thing. Thank you for that information. Ooh, it was a fun thing to explore. I learned many things. And I hope we do some other deep dives with other games. It's fascinating. I love learning about the development of this stuff. And some of this information is easy to find on the internet. Hopefully I brought some new information to some of our listeners. And I had a blast. There are just... And you know what? Maybe in social, I'll have a chance on Twitter to even... Well, I'll source all of the things that I have in my notes, um, in our show notes. But maybe I can also spit out some of these um, transcripts of interviews and stuff. So cool. Cool. Awesome. I'm going to check for those too. Oh man, I found an interview where they, where Miyamoto and Koji Kondo and, and uh, Tezuka were joking about, and I think Anuma wasn't in that yet. He came along more, he's been, he was responsible, he was very responsible for Breath of the Wild now, but he came along like he was a code designer in Ocarina, but he really took the reins in Majora's Mask and Wind Waker and then mm-hmm. Twilight Princess. And he's really, really the brain behind Zelda these days. And Miyamoto is more of a almost an executive producer kind of role where sure. he has his thoughts and he has his comments. But Anuma these days is really, I think he's doing a fantastic job. And if Breath of the Wild is Anuma's version of reimagining Miyamoto's version of the original The Legend of Zelda, that makes me all warm and fuzzy. <laughs> I'm into it. Awesome. All right, let's get out of here. Uh, next right. week, uh, 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 people can tweet the show if they have any thoughts about this or want to learn more and want to continue chatting with me and or Kate about this. They can tweet the show at Another Zelda Pod or find us on Instagram at Another Zelda Podcast. Facebook is the same. You can go to our website, anotherzeldapodcast.com uh, to find links to all of our old episodes. This is definitely the kind of show where you can dig back into old episodes. They're not really like time-based or anything like that. No, so I invite listen our listeners. in whatever order you want. Yeah, I love it. One of the, my favorite things is sometimes we'll get a comment from a listener and uh, we, we will often get uh, some kind of comment on Facebook about like, hey, found your show yesterday. I'm on episode six. That's you know, I'm crazy. loving it. Oh, it makes me feel so good. It's we so don't cool. have that many. Slow down. <laughs> Slow down. We only do this every other week. Yeah. <laughs> Don't have that many. Maybe in season two we can put out more, but I, I I'm okay with this pace for now. Yeah. Doing doing good healthy episodes. I enjoy coming here and recording these episodes with you, Kate, and I uh, oh. couldn't be happier to be making this show. So if people want to be talking, if people would like to find you personally on the internet um, to share their thoughts, maybe of like what the Legend of Zelda was to them, the original 1986 release or 87, depending on where you live. Where can they find you? Uh, well, they can find me on Instagram. I'm not on the Twitter. Because it confuses me. Okay. Um, so I'm on Instagram at I only take cat pics. Wonderful. Wonderful. People are welcome to find me on Twitter and Instagram by searching Raptor Paint. All one word. And I think that's it. I already did all the show stuff. Awesome. So we'll, uh, I guess we'll see you guys next we're, time. We're coming back with a, we're doing our first pseudo listener requested episode yeah. next week. What are we talking about? We are going to be discussing the I've seen them described as the golden goddesses or the three <laughs> goddesses or the goddesses. Yeah. Uh, basically the three main goddesses that come up in a lot of games in a lot of different ways and um, just going into who they are and the different ways they are used and mm-hmm. all that good stuff. Yeah, they are definitely a thread through the series for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but they do, it does kind of ebb and flow their involvement in different games. And I know you're going to be hosting that episode and I can't wait to discuss some of that. It should be fun. I'll see you in two weeks. Okay, bye.